Can you hear me? Good. I am Jane Lorch. I'm president of the board of the Little Compton Historical Society, with pleasure. And uh, I want to welcome you all to the annual meeting, uh, the year 2020. Um, I hope some of you have been able to go through the exhibit, or you have already. Uh, been able to see it. It is. It was open at six, and um, we will have a very brief business meeting before we um, enjoy this panel of farmers um, and talking about what they do. So, um, I would like to introduce Marjorie O'Toole, our esteemed executive director, and she will give you a brief overview of. What happened in 2020? Okay, I'm going. Good evening, everyone. So, 2020 started on an excellent note. Uh, we started the year with the announcement of a very large gift from the ACB's Family Charitable Fund. Uh, which was pledged not just for this year, but for the next three years in order to help our educational programming. And with that money, we were able to hire our long time, very long time, 15 year seasonal employee, Jenna Magnuski, as a year round part time museum educator and had very high hopes for increasing our programming in 2020. Then COVID hit. And we all knew that all of our public programming was going to look very different that year. Under the leadership of our new board president, Jane Lorch, we worked as a team, the board of directors and the staff, and we adapted to the new situation. First, we made the most of social media and YouTube in order to stay connected to our audience. And our audience expanded dramatically. We redesigned our women's history exhibit to include the outdoor banners, some of which you see still hanging this year. And we really focused our efforts on the project's website by adding over 300 women's biographies to the website. As a result, there were 70,000 visits to our website last year. And the women's history exhibit has been held over for a second year. It's open until October, and I hope you'll come see it if you haven't already. Like everyone else, we learned to Zoom. Even our 90-year-old board members learned to Zoom, and we give them tremendous credit for learning how to do that. And thanks to Jenna, we offered our most robust lecture series in recent memory to an online audience all across the country last year. I think as an organization, we came out of 2020 stronger and smarter. Our website improved, our, our ability to offer digital programming blossomed, our membership grew, and our supporters were generous as always. Partway through the year, the board made the very smart decision, and it's going to seem especially smart today, to postpone our historic house tour, which would have been scheduled for next month until next year. And instead of focusing on the historic house tour, we focused our energies instead on creating a permanent exhibit in our 19th century barn that we eventually called Everyone Was a Farmer. And there was something really wonderful about working on something permanent in a crisis situation because we knew that even if we weren't going to be able to welcome you this summer, because it was permanent, we'd be able to welcome you the following summer. And all the time and effort that went into this project would not be wasted. We are thrilled with the results for this exhibit, and we do hope that you and your family and your guests will come and visit it often. We also came out of 2020 very grateful, grateful to our supporters, very grateful to our board members, many of whom work like staff people for us. Um, 
I have five minutes, so I can't mention everyone, but I do want to mention in particular two committees, the Nelson Farm Committee that was led by Bart Brownell and began working on that project last summer, and also our Everyone Was a Farmer Committee that began that work this time last year um, and included Fred Bridge, our collection, collections manager, Steve Lubar, our co-curator, and Shelley Bowen, who's responsible for all the beautiful graphic design in both this exhibit and the Women's History exhibit. And finally, I want to mention a key part of that exhibit committee and many, many other exhibit committees. Dora Milliken has volunteered here since she was a teenager. <clears throat> and I was very sad last week to um, receive her notice of retirement from the board of directors. So Dora does so much for us, especially on the collections committee, especially involving our exhibits. Uh, we are very sad to see her go, and she will be very missed. And, and absolutely welcome back if she ever changes her mind. Um, finally, I'd like to recognize and thank my coworkers. They have managed to carry this organization through a completely unpredictable year, and they work every day to make the Historical Society more vibrant and more responsible than, uh, responsive than ever before. So Kristen Aguiar is a wonderful seasonal worker who does tours for us and keeps us open on the weekends. Carol Scanlon is here with us tonight. She is our year-round administrator. She keeps everything running smoothly and is a delight to work with. So thank you, Carol. We, on Tuesday mornings, that's the first we see each other after the weekend. So we have the weekend update on Tuesday mornings. And finally, Jenna Magnuski, our museum educator, who truly has been critical in providing quality digital and in-person programming to our audience this challenging year. So thank you to the staff and the board and to our supporters. And I would like to call up Art Brownell, our treasurer, for the treasurer's report. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Bart Brownell, treasurer of the society, uh, here to bring you up to date on our financial performance. The year 2020 was not what we'd hoped for. A COVID surge in March upset all our plans. We had to cancel our season opening party, the antique show, and large in-person exhibition viewing. So COVID had an impact on our financial performance, but not nearly the impact we feared. Without ticket sales to our annual fundraising events or admission to the museum, total revenues were 201000 versus 223000 the year before. But expenses were reduced even more to 190000 versus the prior year's 221000 So we ended 2020 with a small profit of $11,000, bettering break-even results in fiscal 2019. Each year we start with a bit of nail biting, wondering if the steadfast financial support we've had in the past from this community can possibly continue, especially a concern last year due to the pandemic. I'm happy to say you came through once again with annual appeal donations of almost $100,000 and exhibit sponsorships for our Women's History Project of an additional $38,000. Meanwhile, our growing membership list resulted in dues rising almost 20%, $26,000, with no increase in fee schedule. So in all, 82% of the funding we depend on to pay staff, maintain our buildings, and mount exhibitions came from checks written by individuals like you. I also want to thank those who responded to our grant applications with generous support, including the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, the Rhode Island Foundation, Enbridge, Inc., and the state legislature with grants aggregating $15,000. We're also most grateful to the Acebes Family Charitable Fund for their generosity in funding our much expanded program of educational outreach, both in person and online, with a new staff member, as you've heard, Jenna Magnuski. 
finally, we thank the Carter Family Funds for their reliably generous annual support. Can't thank all of you enough. Meanwhile, after a sharp sell-off in March, Wall Street discovered unexpected animal spirits, such that our investment portfolio wound up the year well in the black, rising 145000 in value to a new record of $1,250,000. Our portfolio allocation is 27% cash, 66% equities, and an additional 7% in yield-rich preferreds. We on the investment committee feel good about our portfolio's ability to generate income for operations while maintaining a risk-minimizing cash position alongside a healthy allocation to long-term growth, utilizing low-cost index funds. It was a year that ended so much better than we feared. Thank you for your attention, and as always, for your enthusiasm for our work, which makes being a part of this society and a part of this community so rewarding. Thank you. Hello, I'm Shelley Bowen, and I'm here on behalf of the nominating committee. And um, on behalf of that nominating committee and the board of directors, we present this evening um, the slate of candidates for our 2021-2022 year. <clears throat> um, for Little Compton Historical Society officers, President Jane Lorch, Vice President Stephen Lubar, Treasurer Bart Brownell, Secretary Helen Richmond Webb, and Assistant Treasurer George Kilborn. Directors, Shelley Bowen, Fred Bridge, Bart Brownell, Randy Byers, Juanita Goulart, Richard Lyle, Richard Menashe, J. William Middendorf, Jr., Carolyn Montgomery, Christopher Rawson, Maureen Rigo, Michael Steers, Paul Sattel, and Caroline Wilkie Wardell. May I have a motion to accept the slate of candidates as presented? I have a uh, motion. Can I have a second, please? Thank you. All in favor, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. So, okay. <laughs> so um, this concludes the business portion of our um, program tonight. I'll turn it over uh, to our panel. So we're very happy to welcome tonight five farmers, past and present, um, who are each going to tell a brief story about their experiences. And then, un unless it's really dark outside, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, and we are going to call Dorothy Goulart first. Thank you. So I'm Dorothy Goulart. Uh, my parents were Joseph and Lorraine Goulart. Um, and I started working on the farm along with my sister Margaret and my cousin George, Chris's dad, uh, when I was 11 years old and continued to work uh, until I graduated from uh, URI School of Nursing in, in 1976. Uh, so I'm an example of a past farmer. Um, I just wanted to share that my experience of working on the farm, I think, influenced my decision um, to become a nurse. Uh, and I just wanted to share a couple of, of stories with you about the kinds of things that I did while I was growing up and working uh, that, that led me to think about doing that. And the first was, is, you know, one of the first jobs that we were given when we went to work on the farm is, is we would feed the calves. And so uh, at first, uh, when they were babies, you would feed them with a pail that had a nipple on it, but then you fairly quickly had to transition them into drinking minus the nipple just directly out of the pail, which sounds a lot easier uh, than it actually is and took a fair amount of patience, but uh, thankfully uh, we were able to successfully do that. From that we moved on to, um, I was completely fascinated with watching the cow's calf. I thought, you know, birth of a new animal was such an amazing thing. Uh, but there were times when it didn't go so well, and you had to do more than watch, which was you actually had to get in there 
and, uh, and assist them. And of course, Dad and Uncle George did the majority of that. Uh, but there were times when they would ask for our help and allow us, especially in the sort of final stages, the calf was being born and then we got to clear the airway. Um, of course, it, it became funny to me later that, you know, I cleared airways in adults in a much very different way than I did with a calf, which was using a piece of, uh, piece of hay in their nostril. Um, Dad and Uncle George both had the ability when our cows needed to have intravenous fluids and uh, calcium and, and dextrose, a, a sugar solution, were common. And they had the ability to be able to put a needle right in the jugular vein. Uh, and then we would have the bottle of, of, of fluids with the rubber hose and we would, we would attach. And we actually served as the IV pole, you know, holding the bottle up uh, in the air while it, while it ran in. And, you know, I always started off strong, but I have to admit that it didn't take too long before I was swapping back, switching hands because my arm uh, was getting tired. Uh, we would give injections, antibiotics, uh, to our cows, and, and I'm here to tell you that uh, my patients were happy to learn that my first injection was given to a cow uh, rather than a human. That came, uh, that came later on, and that's a story for another day for anybody who's interested in, in that transition. Um, but the story that I want to leave you with is, is one that, um, believe it or not, has stuck with me all these years. It was a very rainy day and we realized that one of our cows had calved down in the pasture. And so dad and I went down to find the cow and the calf and bring them back to the barn. Well, when we got down there, we realized that the cow was down and couldn't get up. Uh, there was a, uh, a problem the cows would have called milk fever. I learned later on it's really all about uh, uh, insufficient level of calcium in the bloodstream and that's what leads to the, the muscle weakness. So anyway, um, this particular cow happened to be in a low-lying area in the field, and, and there was a puddle that, had, uh, that was forming, and, and her head was in that puddle. So Dad said to me, you have to, you have to get down. You've got to hold this cow's um, head out of the puddle. Um, I'm going to go up and get the tractor and the, and the, the skid. Uh, and some more help so that we can get this cow back up in, into the barn. And so there I was, kneeling in the puddle, holding this cow's head in my lap, praying that this cow would not die on my watch uh, until Dad and, and Uncle George could get back and, and we could get the cow in the barn. Well, you'll be happy to know that we successfully did that. The cow, uh, after uh, both a bottle of dextrose and a bottle of calcium, uh, was able to get up and did just fine. The calf was fine. But I think that was a moment when I truly realized that having the ability to help and, and help to heal uh, was uh, an important way for me to think about my career and, and had, a lot to do, had a lot to do with me deciding to uh, pursue that as a career. So that's my stories. I hope you enjoyed them. Roger Green, and maybe Dorothy can slide the microphone to Roger. Um, let me know if I'm not talking loud enough or close enough to the mic. Uh, Marjorie asked me to talk about a particular day on a dairy farm that happened 45 years ago. And I can't think of many days in my life where I would remember any specific details about what had happened on that day. This particular day, though, I remember everything. It was, and uh, I will tell you that it was, a, it was a day in December of 1974, winter day. There was a, a winter storm, an incredibly strong, uh, nor'easter, winter nor'easter, uh, gale force winds when uh, Roger Turcott and I started milking uh, in his barn that, that morning. Except for the storm, didn't start out much different from any other milking day. Uh, 
we were uh, perfectly comfortable inside. It was warm and tight inside. The cows, 55 cows, had been in their stanchions all night long. So the barn was warm, even though it was cold outside. And we were milking the um, way we always had. Uh, he would milk down the east side of the barn, the stanchions, there were stanchions lined up along the east wall, along the west wall. He would milk down the east wall stanchions. I would milk the cows along the west side. Um, you'll see in a bit why that arrangement uh, is relevant here. Uh, we'd been milking maybe an hour and a half, as we always had, pretty much ignoring the storm until ignoring it became impossible. It was uh, all of a sudden, the wind picked up like a freight train. And the barn began to creak. Then there was a loud crack. And then the barn collapsed on us. Uh, uh, Roger Turcott at the time was more toward the north end of the barn, the older part of the barn that had uh, more stone. It was a, that part of the barn was mostly stone. And that stone helped to support some of the collapsed barn. Uh, that might have been what made it possible for him to get out. I was uh, in the newer part of the barn on the west side, all wood, no stone. And the way the barn collapsed, I'll explain, because it had to do with the way the wind was blowing. It was a northeast wind, so the barn was collapsing westward. The whole west wall just collapsed outward and coming down on us, or on me at this point, was um, the rafters, uh, shattered timbers, tons of winter stored hay that had been in the loft. And it all came crashing down. I was hit by uh, timbers in the head, chest, knocked down uh, against concrete the edge of a concrete stanchion, and pretty much trapped. I was just caught in this tiny, tiny space with timbers on top of me and hay on top of that. Over the wind and terrified cows, I heard uh, Roger Turcott calling to me. He said, Roger, are you, where are you? Are you okay? And, uh, I could just, I caught back and said, I'm not okay. I'm trapped can't move. And this point, this is the point that uh, it just, it's just embedded in my mind. I, uh, Roger Turcotte risked his life at that point to save mine. He went back into the barn, made his way through this tiny, twisted crawl space, about the only crawl space that was left under the collapsed barn, and it was still creaking and falling at this point. It was, it, it hadn't collapsed completely, but it was, it was still incredibly dangerous. He made his way through this twisted passageway uh, to the place where I was trapped. He yanked me out with incredible force. It took force to get me out of that jam. I was under timbers. And then he pulled me out like a rag doll back through that twisted passageway, just as we made it out, there was another loud crack and the barn collapsed the rest of the way down to the concrete floor of the barn. The passageway closed up that, that we had just been in, the place where I had been trapped was closed up, uh, and it was just seconds that we were out. Then, what seemed like just as quickly, and it, was, it obviously was a few minutes, but it didn't feel at the time like it was that long, all of a sudden there were people everywhere helping, trying to get the uh, cows that were trapped in the, in the barn out. They were, cows were terrified, they were injured, they were, uh, well, I'll explain how the people got there. As soon as the barn collapsed, Mrs. Turcott, or, uh, or Judy Turcott, their daughter, had called for help, and the people that showed up were the volunteer fire department and civil defense. And some of them 
came with chainsaws, and they were just, they were cutting through uh, the roof, because the roof at this point was flat on the, in the barn, cutting through the roof, through broken timbers, um, even cutting through bales of hay, and then pulling out um, terrified and injured cows. Uh, one of the volunteers somehow had the forethought uh, to bring a gun. Uh, at that point, I was, uh, somebody helped me into uh, Mrs. Turcott's kitchen where I was on the floor uh, just injured, and I heard a couple of shots, gunshots. I was told afterwards that the, one of the cows that had to be shot was the very cow that I was milking when, when the barn fell down. Uh, it, uh, I had just knelt down beside that cow to milk it when, uh, when the barn collapsed. And so that broken cow really helped to create a small space where, where I had been uh, before, before the barn fell. Uh, the volunteers spent, I don't know how much time, they were there until they managed to get out as many cows as they could possibly save, which was most of them. And their volunteer help didn't stop there. They, those people and contractors and carpenters in the weeks afterwards rebuilt Roger Turcott's barn to help get his cows out of the winter weather. And they rebuilt a uh, milk parlor so that Roger Turcott would be able to milk cows after that because everything was destroyed. Uh, they replaced it with um, a pole barn rather than a traditional barn and the difference, for those of you who don't know dairy farming, although many of you probably do, um, the traditional barn had rows of stanchions and the cows would uh, be in their stanchions while they were being milked and they would stay, they would be in their stanchions and the people milking them would just work their way um, down from stanchion to stanchion, milking the cows. Uh, in the pole barn, the arrangement wasn't like that at all. They would, the cows would be in the pole barn, for shelter, no stanchions, and they would just sort of mill around until it was milking time and for a small group of cows which would be led into the milk parlor, milk, then brought out. Other cows would be brought in. Uh, it's supposed to be an efficient way uh, to milk, cows didn't adjust well to that at all. They, they are really creatures of habit. They were used to coming into the barn, going in their stanchions, and staying. Uh, so in this situation, they would be milling around until it, uh, it was time to be milked, and then instead of a few coming into the milk parlor, they would all try and come in at once. You know, the same way they had all gone into the barn at once. That's what they'd done for years. That's what they were trying to do now. So. Every milking time was utter confusion for the cows, which turned out to be really difficult milking time for Mr. Turcott, who would try to create order out of this chaos twice a day. Uh, then, to make matters worse, jumping ahead a bit, to make matters worse for Mr. Turcott and for other farmers all over the country, is that there became a huge surplus of, in milk production. Far more milk being produced than there was demand for. So the price of that farmers were paid for milk dropped below what it cost them to raise, to raise a cow and to milk that cow. As Roger Turcott was telling me, he said, every day I go out to milk, I'm losing money. Um, the federal government tried to come up with a solution for that, and they developed a federal buyout program where they would uh, pay farmers to take their cows out of production uh, in order to reduce the supply sufficiently. It worked to some extent. Um, they took one and a half million cows out of production, and I mean, there were all kinds of reasons why people went out of the business. That's just one. But to give you an idea of what happened to dairy farming in 
Rhode Island is that, we can just look at the figures. In 1964, there were 100 dairy farms in the state. That's 400 dairy farms in the state. This year, 2021, there are fewer than 10. So the collapsing of Roger Turcotte's barn is just one dramatic example of what might make a farmer have second thoughts about staying in dairy farming. Hard, hard life, and not only hard, but as it turned out, not even profit. Oh, sure. And next we'll hear from Chris Goulart, who is a younger generation of Franlot Farm descendants. And Chris now runs Franlot Nursery on that property. And want to bring that mic over. Uh, hello. Not quite that tall. Um, so, so yeah, as Marjorie was saying, um, I am the current owner of... Um, it's now Franlart Nurseries. Um, it's the same, actually, the same farm that that Dorothy um, grew up on, um, and uh, you know her father and my grandfather um, farm ran a dairy farm together. Um, uh, it's kind of a perfect transition. Uh, they got out during the the um, of dairy farming um, in the with the the, the farm buyout program. Um, and so while we both grew up working on the same farm, we we had very different. Um, very different experiences. So I'm the fourth generation um, to farm that property in, in, in our family. I'm, I'm the second to farm it as, as a nursery. Um, and so the, the, the cows were sold 30 some odd years ago. I'm 34. So my only, you know, memories are just sort of fleeting ones. But, but I was there from the beginning um, of, of the nursery. Um, which was an, sort of an interesting experience. Because obviously as a young child, everything is new to me, but growing um, was new to uh, my father as well. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it was, it was interesting sort of getting to see from a young age the, um, you know, some of the successes he had with growing trees and some of the sort of the, the, the failures and sort of learn, being able to learn um, along with him um, kind of what works and what doesn't. Um, so, you know, currently right now we, we, we grow trees and shrubs. Um, I, I grow most of my stuff for um, uh, Sylvan Nursery in, in, in Westport, but we do other wholesale and, and, and retail sales as well. Um, so sort of growing up in that way, when, when um, I, I got to college, again, like Dorothy, I decided to go to the University of, of Rhode Island um, and um, uh, decided to study horticulture. Um, this was sort of an eye-opening experience because right away I was learning about a lot of the stuff that went wrong. I was learning why it went wrong. Um, you know, for example, you know, we, we would grow, um, we used to grow a blue atlas cedar and they would get um, uh, Phomopsis every year and we, we would spray them every year and, and, and it would get it the next year, we'd spray it again and we, we you know, we're deciding maybe not, not to grow it anymore. Um, I remember my freshman year, I was in a plant pathology class and learning um, about the fungus Phomopsis and that it, it overwinters in the needles. And if you rake up the needles that, that drop from the plants, it won't get it the following year. And so I went and did that and so we didn't have Phomopsis the following year. Um, so I was having this practical experience and there, there were other things too, I, we, you know, learning in a, a, a plant identification class about Viburnum dentatum and how they don't like wet feet. And, Remembering, like, well, that's why the 300 viburnum dentatum that we planted in our bottom field all died, um, and so there was there was a sort of a lot of experiences like that, um, and that was sort of very kind of very exciting. Um, when I graduated, I, I went to a um, I did an internship, a summer internship at a um, Carlton Plants. Um, it was a 2,000 acre out um, 2,000 acre nursery out in Oregon. Um, and that was an interesting sort of part for my education as well, um, but more so because of the, the, the timing. So Carlton Plants, is a, it's, a, it's a big nursery. They, they grow everything. Um, you know, they start things from seeds and from, from, from cuttings, and they grow them for a few years. And the size that they sell them is like the size that we get them in. Um, and they'll go their clear entire fields, um, and they, uh, they bare root the plants, and they, 
wrap them up and put them in a freezer and until they're ready to, to sell. Um, so this was 2009 when I graduated, so a year after the housing market crash. Um, and so the nursery industry also crashed at that time too. If people aren't buying new houses, they're not, buy, you know, they're not buying trees to put in their yards. So one of my jobs as an intern was taking all these trees that were in the freezer that other years would have been sold and just throwing them into a dumpster. We're kind of like, <laughs> welcome to the industry. Um, I, I spent a lot of time too when I was there because there's a lot of really large nurseries in the area um, driving around and going to nurseries and just introducing myself saying I was a you know whatever college graduate and intern in the area and, and people usually you know talk to me um, and there was a lot of desperation a lot of people were going out of business um, but there was also I kind of got two sides there were the people who were they were going they were going to survive and it was they were going to kind of figure out a way and then there were the people who were just you know, they were going to close up. Um, I was talking to one, um, an owner of one large nursery who was saying that, you know, the, the year before, you know, their, their sales had been cut $450,000, um, and it was going to put them out of business, but they had realized they had never sold to Kentucky before. So they decided it was this untapped market, and they sent all their salespeople to Kentucky, and um, they ended up making up what, what they had lost, and it saved their, saved their business. Um, so I, so kind of coming home, I, I tried to take sort of that, that mindset of, um, you know, just kind of do what you can to survive. It helped last year during COVID when we were shut down in, in April and May at our busiest time. And, you know, we sell, you know, 70% of our plants on those two months and we were shut down um, and kind of had to use that, to, you know, sort of that mindset to sort of get, um, get through. Um, so I continued to work at the farm for a few years, um, and then um, uh, I, I got married, and, and um, in uh, 2013, um, I decided I kind of, I wanted to keep working in horticulture, but sort of wanted to try something different. Um, and so I took an, uh, an internship at the, the National Arboretum um, in Washington, D.C. Um, that year, they were taking on quite a few interns. Um, there was, I think, 13 of us. Um, and uh, it's a, the National Arboretum, it's a 450-acre, uh, it's, a, it's a USDA facility. It's where, where they do research on trees. Um, um, but it's also a public garden as well. Um, and so all of the other interns were working in the different, these different collections. They had a few people ab above them. Each, you know, you'd have a couple interns to one collection. Um, for me, I was split between the conifer collection and the boxwood collection, and I was put there um, because the conifer person, my first day was her last day, and the boxwood collection person had just retired. Um, and I, you know, I, was the, I was 26 at the time. I was the only intern who was not either still in college or just a college graduate, and they kind of figured, okay, like you, uh, you know, basically they show me the two collections and say work two, two days a week here, three days a week here, kind of just do what you think needs to be done. Um, so I was an intern making $11 an hour, maintaining the national, you know, the national boxwood, or the national reference collection of boxwood. And, um, it, was, it was funny. Um, so it was a, a three-month, it was supposed to be a six-month internship. After three months, I was offered uh, a job um, by the people who were funding my, um, my internship. Uh, the, excuse me, the Friends of the National Arboretum. And so that was an interesting job. Um, I, I, I worked there for, for, for a few years. Um, there's something different all the time. They didn't have a horticulturalist on staff at the time, so a, a lot of what I did was, you know, I would give, I'd give tours or I, I would talk to, I'd talk to donors. Um, I actually did their bookkeeping. Um, they, they had me take um, accounting classes. Um, and it was, it was interesting, something, again, something different every day, um, but... <laughs> It also didn't pay well, and D.C. is an expensive place to live. Um, and so when my wife was pregnant, um, we talked about kind of what we wanted to do. Um, originally, we were going to stay, um, but uh, my father had stopped growing new trees um, a few years earlier, and he had actually gotten a new job um, with the USDA. And they had mentioned, you know, the idea of us maybe coming back and, and um, renting the the property from them and if, if we'd be interested. Um, both my parents and my wife's parents live, live in town and so 
Um, it's kind of a last minute decision. She was eight months pregnant when we moved back. Um, but we, we, decided, we decided to do it. So um, that was in 2016. Um, and we rented for, for a few years. And, and right away we started, um, uh, we started expanding the business pretty aggressively. So my dad, was a, he, he did the nursery, but, but his, his main job was he, was he was an arborist as well. So he uh, took down trees and did landscaping and whatnot. He was the, he was the tree warden here in town. And the, the nursery was kind of like a side business. It was like a way for him to just keep the, the farm and the family. Um, for me, this was going to be my only source of income, so I, I knew if I wanted to um, actually make a living do it, that, that, that I'd have to grow quite a bit. Um, so we started finding new fields to grow on, and, and including Dorothy's backyard um, uh, and another neighbor, and we just got another 10 acres this past, um, this past year. We're growing um, from the Sakana Preservation Association. And just kind of sort of built, started to build up um, what, what we were doing. Um, to, uh, 2018, we bought the business from my parents. And then in 2019, we had started to discuss the idea of buying the land from them, but basically what they needed to retire and make it sort of things fair for my, bro my brothers was more than we could afford and still run the nursery. And so um, we approached the Agricultural Trust and um, sort of came up with this idea where we'd sell the development rights um, to most of the farm um, to them um, and sort of the remainder of what my parents wanted to get we, um, we would pay and so we, we ended up doing that and, and um, my wife and I bought the farm last year so the end of 2019 um, of course our first year owning it was, was last year which which was tough, but, but again, we had already been running it for the last five, you know, again, since the last five years. Um, and so we were sort of established enough where um, we, could, we could make it work. Um, yeah, that's kind of we are now. Next, I'd like to introduce Liz Peckham Paul. Liz grew up as a child at Peckham Greenhouse and now with her own family. Uh, she and her husband and son run Wishing Stone Farm. This one? Did this one do it? Dave, you just give us the high sign when she should start, okay? that working? Hello? Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Liz Peckham, and together with my husband Skip Paul and our son Silas, we run Wishing Stone Farm here in town. I have had a long life of being part of a farming family. First on the Peckham farm, watching my father selling wholesale to shifty middlemen who offered nothing for very hard work. At age 12, I started helping with chores, like planting cabbage and picking potatoes. By the time I was in high school, my parents had shifted their farm's focus to expanding greenhouse growing, focused mostly on retailing ornamental plants for house and gardens. I left Little Compton for several years to learn about printing technology at college, but sitting at a desk for work was clearly not for me and I happily found my way back to greenhouse work in the family's growing business. I had a ton of energy and felt proud of my strength. Women's sports were not yet an option in my youth, and I actually did not enjoy competition at all, so working hard with nature gave me an opportunity to shine. My mother was an inspiration as she worked hard alongside my father to create their vision. Several years after Skip and I married, a new farm was created out of Skip's vision. I was reluctant at first, but over time realized it was important to work on our shared vision together for our home farm. Women have always been a huge part of the farming community. 
In the past, they were mostly considered background support. I would like to imagine for our ancestors, it was more like total support with little to no credit. They often took on tasks that no, no one else had time to do and filled in when laborers were missing while raising children and keeping intense household chores going, often managing the bookkeeping and social responsibilities as well. Sorry to report that in the early years of my life, it was also very embarrassing to be from a farm family. I can see clearly that nothing has changed in the work we do, but in my younger years, it was not cool to be a farmer. Those who had fathers commuting away to work always seemed way cooler. Adding to that, as a vegetable farmer, we were considered less than dairy farmers because they tended animals, which made their lives even more complicated and much more interesting. One of my childhood best friends, Diane Goulart, was from a dairy farm, and our grade school sleepovers were scheduled around her rotating weekends to get up super early to help with milking the cows. As an adult, we have some best friends in New Hampshire that are vegetable farmers as well, and the rest of their family remains dairy farmers. She still, to this day, gets teased for being lazy. Fast forward, and nothing has changed too much in the life of a farmer, except now we are way more respected and occasionally even called heroes. How did this happen? Growing food for people is now considered a noble occupation. Skip and I have been farming for almost 40 years, and for many of those years, folks thought of the farm as his. All the old timers used to call the old roadside stand Skip's. I guess I was used to it. My own family would not let me be part of Peckham's greenhouse because I was female. They had no ill will towards me at all, really. Just thought my husband could take care of me and that I had no place in ownership in a family business. I am happy to say that things are changing. My niece Carly is being warmly welcomed to be the sixth generation to lead Peckham's greenhouse into the future. Wishing Stone Farm has employed many women over the years and some have gone on to start their own farms. Our government has now made special grants available to women farmers. It is now an awesome time to be a female farmer. I wish people understood how important and satisfying it is to grow food for people. Everyone seems to want a computer job. People think it is totally necessary to spend a fortune on college degree. But if you know a young person with the drive to work with their hands, encourage them to go towards a trade, maybe even farming, because this is what the current world needs more of. And the end result for those inclined will be great satisfaction. I am so encouraged that women are now able to join in these fields too. History, that is what this is group is all about. It has been a life obsession for me and many times a depressing subject because we humans do not learn enough from history. Thanks for letting me share some thoughts with you. Thank you, Liz. And finally, we're gonna welcome Carter Wilkie. And I'm going to let Carter tell you about his wonderful farm in Adamsville. He is our, I think on this panel, he is our newest Little Compton farmer. Hi there. Um, Adamsville that was named for another part-time farmer named John Adams. And uh, Liz, I'm really proud to tell you my youngest daughter is about to go off to college and she's majoring in sustainable agriculture. So uh, the first time I went through this exhibit behind us, I came out and uh, I asked Steve Lubar if uh, today's generation of farmers in Little Compton will go down in the history books as our last. Uh, and neither of us uh, really wanted to predict an answer. So just let the implications of that sink in for a moment. You could travel the entire coastline of New England, all 556 miles of it, and you would pass through one coastal community to the next. You might find 
some, not many communities that could rival Little Compton for its unspoiled beauty. But I would say that what makes Little Compton unique is we we're one of the last farming communities in southern New England and one of the last places in all of New England outside the state of Maine where you can see sailors and farmers in the same zip code. Would Little Compton be Little Compton without farming? Uh, last year during the elections for town council, I was uh, gratified to see candidates of every political persuasion pledge allegiance to the idea of protecting rural character. It seemed to be in our divisive culture today the one thing that everybody at least in Little Compton could agree upon. And this great exhibit here reminds everybody who's not a farmer how vital farmers and farming are to preserving that rural character. Over the last 35 years, the Little Compton Agricultural Conservancy Trust has invested $26 million of our tax dollars, most paid by people who are new to town, to protect more than 2,000 acres of farmland. That is a really unique, incredible achievement for which we should all be thankful. And it preserves a lot of sites for future farming, but by itself it doesn't guarantee a future of farming for Little Compton. I know this because I had the privilege to go to high school in one of the prettiest rural locations on the eastern seaboard, the Brandywine Valley of northern Delaware, gorgeous rolling hills that at the time back in the early 80s was a time of farms. And in the 50 years I've known that locale, uh, thanks to a lot of good work of conscientious people and land trusts, they've preserved the land, but nobody bothered to preserve the farming. And it disappeared. And what I can tell you is that when the number of farms in any location falls below a minimum threshold, the ecosystem of mutual support necessary to sustain farming disappears. The first thing that happens is there aren't enough farms to keep the feed store in operation, and it goes. And next to go is the one guy in town who knows how to repair any kind of farm machinery until ultimately there is no one left to cut and bale hay for the few last holdouts who are raising horses as lawn ornaments. You can't preserve rural character without preserving rural characters, plural. You take the farmer off the land and farmland ceases to be farmland. It's just land that in no time becomes smothered in a tangle of invasive vines as fields revert to woodland. And then we can all watch as Little Compton slowly loses its traditional landscape pattern of open farm fields bounded by stone walls. Do we have a critical mass of farming for Little Compton's identity as a coastal farming community to survive well into the 21st century? I would say it's at a tipping point that could fall either way. I think farming in Little Compton today is like a slowly burning fire that looks quaint and generates some warmth to the people around it but is at risk of burning itself out unless we find a way to throw some new logs onto the fire. So what will it take to do that here? I'd like to offer four things specifically. The first is there's got to be a shared vision and agreement in the town's next comprehensive plan for what it will take to preserve farming in this community. We could look west of us and borrow from the Aquidneck Land Trust, which has survived, surveyed the entire island for where clusters of farming should be concentrated on the map in the future so that ecosystem of mutual support survives. Their plan prioritizes which private farm parcels deserve preserving with public dollars according to criteria that agreed upon in advance. And the great thing about this is it avoids future land, land use disputes when you put it in writing and when everybody knows what to expect from the future. If a new prospective farmer were to come to Little Compton and were to ask, where is the best place in Little Compton for me to put my operation on the map? Would today's town officials know how to answer the question? Second, this plan has got to include a way to recruit the next generation of farmers. Today across Rhode Island, almost half of the new farmers going into farming are not people who inherited land from their family. They are young people like my daughter who's about to go into college, looking for good land to farm in a good climate with a long growing season with proximity to dense urban markets like Providence and Boston. We have all that here in abundance and there is no shortage of people out there looking for the opportunity. If we could lure some of them here, 
they would have, uh, the next generation of farmers might have more in common with the first generation Portuguese farmers who came here in the 19th century to start a new life and put down roots. We could borrow from next door to the east where the Westport Land Conservation Trust over the last eight years has helped to create four new farm enterprises. One is produces farmstead cheese with a herd of dairy goats. Another is growing blueberries. All of these farms have been placed back on the tax roll and the land is being cared for by private owners instead of having to be maintained at town expense. And because of all of these conservation dollars were funded with, with public tax dollars, they do all of these through an open request for proposals, competitive bidding process where anybody is, is able to, to enter. And it gives the town the option to choose who will be the best steward of the land with a farm model that'll be welcomed by the town. And if here, if we did that in Little Compton at the rate of one new farm every two years, we could add five new farms just by the end of the decade alone. Third, this plan would have to address where a young farm couple is gonna live in a town with few starter homes. If we're gonna preserve farms of any specific size, we've gotta make allowance for where a farmer can live on it in the future. Unfortunately, in most instances, we're not doing that here. In the Hudson Valley of New York, which is another beautiful locale, it's very desirable among summer people where their real estate is just as expensive as ours. Towns will allow a new farm couple to erect a barn where the first story is used as the workspace and the living quarters are upstairs. I was talking about that with uh, Michael Steers, who I see is here. Michael chairs our town's planning commission. And Michael informed me that that would be illegal here in Little Compton under the zoning code. So the irony is here in Little Compton, it's legal to build a one-story ranch house out of brick on a two-acre suburban lot, but we can't allow a farm couple to build a work living space in a barn that looks like it's always been here. Maybe it's time for us to revisit our zoning code to see how friendly it is to preserving rural character. And the fourth and final thing that's really critical is consumer demand. Where you spend your household's food budget is going to determine what the landscape around you looks like in the future. The more produce, the more eggs, the more honey, jam, cheese, meat, and trees that you can buy from your neighbors means the more your neighbors that will be able to continue to farm land here in Little Compton. And with climate change and catastrophic weather events, pretty soon I think we're going to have to start asking ourselves, how long can we rely here on the East Coast on California's Central Valley to grow all of our food. To survive in the future, everyone might have to become a farmer once again, and the future may look more like the past when everyone was a part-time farmer. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know this. The future of farming is gonna be different from what we grew up with. It's always been this way, as this exhibit shows, it's been true for generations, with farming always adapting to changing market conditions. I would venture that the future here in a location where the farms are small means farming less commodities sold through middlemen and more direct to consumer and more farm to table. And in locales like this, championed by chefs in nearby cities like Providence and Boston and at institutions like Johnson and Wales. So will today's generation of farmers in Little Compton be our last? Communities have choices. They can accept the future they get handed to them by somebody else, or they can work together to create the future they want to leave to posterity. And the final story that this exhibit tells to future generations is really up to all of us and what we do today. Thank you. Many thanks to all of our speakers. And, you know, clearly we're losing our light but we might be able to have a few questions from the audience. If anyone has a question, I'd have you um, raise your hand and Jenna or Steve Lubar will bring you a microphone. And the microphones are on the snack table. So, I am actually having a little trouble seeing because of the light, but does anyone have a question? Uh, where was No, the... we, we have to use the microphones because we're going to be on the tape. Okay. 
I'd like to know where the farm was, the Turcotte farm was, that Mr. Green referred to. Where was the Turcotte? Uh, Turcotte farm was um, called High Long Farm. And it is off Long Highway between Long Highway and Birchard Avenue. Ran the whole distance between the two. Anybody else? I have to, for transparency's sake, the Turcotte farm was my grandfather's farm. So I was very interested to hear Roger tell the story. I remember sitting on the gym floor as a little girl uh, waiting for school to start. And a, a farmer's son, Curtis Turcotte, Curtis Tripp, was in my class. And he came in and said, your grandfather's farm just fell down on top of him. So uh, that, was a, that was a rough start to the school day. Um, but I did, I did hear quickly that every, the, the people were okay. More questions? My question is for uh, Carter Wilkie. Why did you pick Little Compton? Because everybody was clearly like born here. Um, so I'd love to hear <laughs> that answer from you. One question I get asked with my last name all the time is, are all the, all the Wilkies and Little Compton related? And Roger Wilkie, the proprietor of Wilkie Feeds in Tiverton, told me that when Chester Wilkie Jr. was asked the same question, his answer was always, well, I think we used to be, but we're not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I came here probably for the same reason that any other future farmer would want to come here, is the growing season is the longest in New England. And I considered farming in Vermont where I also lived and the growing season is too short. Uh, it's too cold and it's too far from Boston. Uh, I, I saw kids who would drive down from the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont to Boston just for a day of sales and turn around and drive two and a half and three hours back. I just don't see how folks can make it. You know, for the reasons that I stated, this is just an ideal place to farm with, with the growing season the climate here, uh, the future means it's, it's only going to get warmer. The growing season's only going to get longer. Um, we're lucky to live so close to Providence, so close to Boston, with chefs who value locally produced food from a region where they can talk about the tour and point people down to where it, where it comes from, where they can know their farmers. And uh, so I came here hoping that today's generation would not be the last, and I'm, I'm glad I'm here. And we can take one or two more questions if there are any. And again, I, I can't see you, so we'll rely on Steve and Jenna to find you. Um, I'm just wondering, with um, why did you and Skip versus conventional? Well, I, I could probably Skip could probably answer that better than I, but I think a lot of it had to do with um, initially health reasons. He had just lost several f members of his family to cancer, and um, we were watching the the area around our house being sprayed, and we just were more cautious, I think, and just more concerned. And it just seemed like the cutting edge. He was probably. I think he was probably one of the first organic farmers in Rhode Island, really. So it's, I, I give credit to Skip for that. At that point, I was still reluctant. <laughs> I had watched my family's vegetable farm fail, and I just thought, we're nuts. But um, he, he had foresight, and he also did something that my family never thought of, was direct sales. I mean, that's really, those two things probably gave us the most success. So Skippy gets the credit. Well, no, I don't think so. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And if there are no more questions, we thank you all very much for coming this evening, for helping us elect our new uh, board of directors. And please join me in thanking our speakers for their time and efforts this evening.